very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this afternoon's uh, lecture by Professor Vijay Raghavan. Uh, my name is Abhinandan. I'm the coordinator of the DST Center for Policy Research. And this event is being organized in collaboration with uh, the Center for Sci Society and Policy and, of course, our uh, uh, library, JRD Tata Memorial Library. Um, <coughs> uh, this is the third year uh, of uh, our participation in the International Open Day, uh, Open Access Week celebrations. Uh, we started this in 2017, and uh, we are very glad to uh, be running this uh, every year since then. And uh, when we were making plans for this event, uh, we were sort of uh, wondering what to do. And then, uh, and my colleagues, uh, Shagun Basha here and then Madan Muttu, uh, when we were discussing this, uh, at that time we were aware of uh, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan's, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, declaration of uh, strong support for open access uh, policies. And uh, because of that, uh, we uh, felt that he would be the right person for us to call. And we were absolutely overjoyed when, when uh, he accepted uh, uh, our invitation. And we are very glad to have you with us, uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan. And uh, of course, he's going to be talking about open access uh, to knowledge repositories. And I really don't want to say anything more about this. Uh, but I do uh, want to say that uh, we are in for a really uh, uh, lively and engaging event today, uh, both the lecture and uh, the subsequent uh, uh, Q&A session. And, uh, but I do have uh, a slightly uh, different but uh, equally pleasant task of uh, introducing the chair for this session, um, Professor Rajay Sood. Um, Professor Sood is a, is a legend to those of us uh, in, uh, in the institute. And uh, he had his uh, um, education, bachelor's and master's uh, degrees from Punjab University. And he spent uh, nearly a, a decade and a half at uh, the Indira Gandhi Center for uh, Atomic Research in Kalpakum before uh, coming over to IASC in 1988. And of course, he rose through uh, the ranks here. And then uh, he eventually became the uh, divisional chair of the Division of uh, Physical and Mathematical Sciences. And he held that position for uh, about nearly 10 years. And since then, uh, since his uh, superannuation, he has also been with us as an honorary professor. And we are very glad to have him here. And uh, of course, uh, he is uh, very well known for uh, his uh, strong record of uh, experimental research in, in uh, condensed matter physics. And, uh, uh, and for that, I mean, he has received uh, a lot of uh, honors and, and recognitions. And I just want to mention a few of them. Uh, he's a fellow of Royal Society, and uh, he's also a fellow of all the uh, Indian uh, Academies of Science. And uh, uh, he has uh, received the Padma Shri, and that, was, uh, that happened in 2013. And of course, uh, for today, I mean, his uh, two roles I want to mention. He is the president, current president of the Indian National Science Academy. And uh, he is also a colleague of Professor Vijay Raghavans in the Prime Minister's Science, Technology, and uh, Innovation Advisory Council. And in both those roles, I'm sure he will have uh, uh, a lot of interesting things to say about, uh, about uh, this uh, issue of uh, open access. And I think he's just the right person for us uh, uh, to get us as, uh, as the chair of uh, the session. So with those just few words, uh, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, and uh, I just want to mention a couple more things. Uh, Professor uh, um, uh, Subhaya Arunachalam is uh, some sort of a guiding spirit for us uh, in, in this uh, issue of uh, open access. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was through his nudging that uh, we uh, got into this, uh, uh, these uh, celebrations of uh, open access week every year since uh, 2017. And of course, he's uh, not able to be here with us, but I'm sure he'll be watching uh, us uh, right now through live streaming. So let me uh, give a shout out to Professor uh, uh, Arunachalam right now. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to hand over the mic to um, Professor Ajay Thank you. Ajay, you true tradition of an uh, academic speaker, can I just add my last slide? Yes. <laughs> Till I wait. Oh, you will do double tasking because I am going to say some nice things. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, it's absolutely a great pleasure for me to be here this evening uh, when Vijay talks on a very important topic, uh, so crucial to the whole uh, ecosystem of 
our uh, science and education it affects uh, almost all of us and uh, we can't have a better person than vijay for this because his tweet almost a year back on plan s when half the world didn't know what s stands for which stands for shock and he tweeted that and uh, from that time he has taken uh, uh, great interest and uh, uh, trying to see what india stand should be and i'm sure we all look forward to hear that uh, in the tradition of uh, introducing the speaker let me say a few words because everyone knows him it's not just a cliche that he doesn't need introduction but truly the case for vijay uh, he was at ncbs uh, before he moved as director ncbs before he moved to delhi as secretary dbt uh, from 2013 to 2018 and uh, he has been a principal scientific advisor to government of india and as abhi mentioned uh, uh, heading a very important uh, committee on what he called stic uh, science technology and innovation advisory council to prime minister where stick stick not a stick <laughs> okay a stick so this is really a stick because he has a stick in his hand uh, where the uh, so the pol so what i just want to say is that uh, this committee which meets almost every month except few uh, small break during the election time has been doing a phenomenal job in really identifying the very major issues which uh, we have in the country which would like to really move forward and i am absolutely impressed with vijay's decisiveness and clarity of thought in uh, uh, organizing these meetings and subsequent discussion and follow up so this is a huge uh, welcome change for us and i would like to thank vijay for this uh, uh, task which he has taken and it has a it is a huge responsibility so uh, let me not uh, 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 because uh, you are here for vijay and not for me uh, me to uh, 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 pontificate but just to say that vijay has all the honors which you can think of all fellowships of academy in academy of royal society us academy and all the awards you would like to have so uh, in like just like uh, infosys and so on and also padma shri by government of india and so on so it's tr uh, truly a delight for all of us to have vijay this uh, uh, afternoon and uh, look forward to his uh, talk and then subsequent discussion i am sure you will uh, welcome the uh, discussion which could be heated i hope so and uh, uh, clarity on this very important issue really from india point of view hand over to vijay and then i go and sit there thank you vijay thank you ajay. um thank you very much uh, abhi uh, ajay and uh, shagun for organizing this it's always a pleasure to come here uh, and uh, it's it's uh, wonderful to be able to give this uh, important uh, Uh, to give a talk on this important topic so let me um, divide the top talk into two components one which is a relatively business end which i'll take about a couple of minutes at most to tell you what that's about we'll come back to that later on and then more about why um, open access access to knowledge access to archives are fundamentally very important that will be the bulk of my talk and i hope we'll have enough time for questions we started uh, a bit uh, later than i thought we would uh, but uh, i'll try to catch up so first of all the business end we pay a huge amount for subscriptions to scientific journals india pays the indian government pays through institutions directly and so on about 1500 crores per year on subscriptions in addition the government directly or indirectly through your grants or by other ways you pay open access charges these are actually author publishing charges i shouldn't call them open access charges and those author publishing charges amount to much less it's less than 200 crores more like 150 crores so keep these two numbers in mind now this is 
access to publicly funded research all over the world. In other words, if you have a subscription to a journal at the IISC, you and IISC can access it, but someone outside cannot. And if you want to publish something for others to have access immediately, you need to pay perhaps in addition to the author publishing charges, open uh, access charges. The, this edifice has to crumble and it is happening globally. And our position from the government of India is that we must reach the following goal, where for a certain standardized subscription fee across journals, across publishers, across learned societies, we have access to everyone. In other words, every citizen in India should be able to access scholarly material for any purpose whatsoever across the country. Because we are in an electronic age, this is feasible. That's number one. Secondly, author publishing charges should be included in this or directly played, paid by government funding agencies. And therefore, this issue of access and where, uh, what you pay for access should be negotiated and solved. Fundamentally, this requires a change in our mindset also inside. We have the current situation not only because of the way publishing houses have developed, but also because of the way we have developed in the metrics of science. We have put individuals at the center and not the scientific enterprise at the center. We talk about what awards individuals have received, but we must keep in mind two things. They are a consequence of science, right, and not to be chased in and of themselves. And there are many, 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 many people who deserve these awards, and therefore anyone who gets them represents the community and not themselves. So these are fundamental changes which we need to uh, keep in mind. Now, that said, there have been enormous changes happening in this sector. We have had multiple meetings with people, the, the science academies, within government, with, uh, with the publishers. And the government has also taken multiple initiatives. We'll come back to all the initiatives which we're taking on this topic a little later when we come to the discussion. But the fundamental issue at the heart of access is about having access to all material, from school to research material, in any language you want. And there, the National Digital Archives is a place you should visit, and all institutions should populate because that has these kinds of repositories. It links to national and global repositories, and in theory, allows access to everyone. In practice, it has to improve a lot, but that's, that's one direction one can go to. It's uh, got, um, you can go to the website. I've got a clip from that. That's a slide I was adding, just to say that it's got famous people like Ajay Sood also in it. Um, over there, is there a pointer here? You edited the last That's why, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to take a little break, but there's no. Yeah, it's okay. Don't worry. But 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 the digital archives does have you know all these excellent people and many many more. It's something to visit. Okay. Now let's get. We'll come back to all this about archives and access and so on soon. But let's step back a bit and see how all of this happened. We are extraordinarily unusual as organisms on this planet. We have a disproportionately large brain to our body size. And we have the most number of neurons per body for any other organism. And this allows us to have a computational system which is grossly over-designed for its basic early purpose. And as a consequence of that over-design, as a consequence of our ability to make tools, as a consequence of domestication of plants and animals, we have changed the planet inexorably. But much more recently, because of language and communication, our pace of cultural evolution is far, far more than genetic evolution. And this has changed the planet into something which we try to survive as humans into one which we control. And therefore, there's an enormous responsibility on us to uh, deal with this, thank you, deal with the situation in what today is called the Anthropocene, where the fate of the planet is determined by human activity. 
In that situation, because of language and its consequences in many ways uh, and what we have done, knowledge is power. And this has been said by many people over centuries many times. Those who have had knowledge have had power. And knowledge has always been in the hands of a few. And power has always been in the hands of a few. So the question is, if knowledge were available more widely, if access to knowledge were available more widely, would power also not be in the hands of a few? There have always been subversive elements who try to get knowledge to the people and power to the people. And here is one of them in Manchester, talking to workers over there during the first industrial revolution, exhorting them to fight for their rights. Yet, this exhortation by itself doesn't work out. One does get you know, various kinds of benefits. And as a consequence of these kinds of movement for rights of people, of workers, Many economies did develop into ones where workers and a large number of citizens had, right, uh, had, had, uh, uh, had rights of a kind which were not there in other economies. So the Scandinavian countries, for example, are, an, uh, are ones where the profits of the system went to a larger number of people as also knowledge as well as power. But what has happened over several decades since the first industrial revolution in 1800 to, to the what's called industry 4.0 right now is that increasingly you find a situation where knowledge, understanding, and design are the controlling elements of industry as opposed to what we can see, the nuts and bolts and how they work. Those were important then, but it's not just your ability to understand how a locomotive or a uh, car works, now knowledge by itself can be controlling. One example is the recent dispute between America and China on a chip. Uh, and Qualcomm was at the center of it, if I'm right. And Qualcomm is a company which manufactures chips without any manufacturing plant whatsoever. It's entirely based on its design. And about I heard recently, I think the figure is perhaps close to being right, if not right, that 70% of Qualcomm's design engineers are based in Hyderabad. So you have a situation where one of the most powerful chip companies in the world, anchored on design, is working with Indian talent uh, and, and leveraging the uh, changes in the economy. So knowledge is the driver of social and economic change. And this has been so for some time. And if you look at the amounts of investment uh, in the knowledge economy by different countries, those who have invested more and seen that the investment is valuable have accelerated in social and economic change much more than others. So that's a big demand on our system. How can we manage to do that? Now, if you go to these big four agencies, McKinsey and, and so on and so forth, they will tell you what the future looks like better than they claim, many astrologers. <coughs> and in their view, in 2050, the drivers of global growth will be what are called the emerging economies. And these economies, India, for example, will be one of them, will be amongst the leading economies in 2050. Much before that, by 2035 or so, India will perhaps be the third largest economy in the world. But it will be a very large economy and also simultaneously a poor country unless we do something now. So there is a great opportunity because of this being a knowledge economy for us to do something so that not only is India a major economic power, but it has major inclusiveness, uh, preservation of its biodiversity, its environment, and so on and so forth. There are other metrics of what are, what's the situation is now heading towards this. And one is the global competitiveness study, which is released every year. And the 2019 one pointed out some key factors for India. That is, our workforce, our workforce in industry, uh, about a little over a half is skilled. Uh, a little less than a half, about 46%, is reasonably well skilled. It doesn't need more reskilling right now over the next few years. But 
the rest of that over, over half needs killing of from less than a month to at least over a year. So a very large fraction of our workforce is not fit for purpose. So even from a very industrial point of view as opposed to a knowledge generation point of view, um, you know, the access to knowledge and training is going to be very important for the economy. There's another big challenge we have and that is the rift between India and Bharat as it's called, as people call it. So if you look at our population distribution across city types, you find that in 2030, the metros will account for about 8% and rural areas will account for about 44%. So even so, even though we'll come down from 59% to 44%, the number of people in rural areas will be huge. So special attention to how knowledge can have and opportunity can be accessible in rural areas is critically important. So that needs a special kind of attention. And finally, the key aspect for us to be competitive in every way and have sustainable development is environment and health. Uh, nine out of the 10 most uh, polluted cities, large cities in the world today are in India and we need to drastically change that and very rapidly. And therefore, in a knowledge economy, how we do that is critically important. So where does knowledge come from? Knowledge is the consequence of research, inquiry, and therefore research is critical for our accumulation of knowledge uh, first, and then its uh, dispersal into our system and back. So research has many challenges. Is, can you see that at the back? Do you want these lights dimmed? Is it possible? Uh, Otherwise, Shagun, don't worry if you can see. It. Yeah. yeah. Um, don't worry if you can't. Uh. Yeah, wow. I was just going to say, bus, 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 bus. I was just going to say that Murphy's Law says that's the last switch will always be the right one. Yeah. But, but anyway. But yeah. Um, so, Research is important for knowledge, and teaching and research are intricately linked. The IISC is terrific that it links that, and now has that link to undergraduate education. But 95% of our students go to state universities where there's very little, if any, research. And 5% of our students go to the central universities where, again, the research needs to be enhanced. And most of our funds go to these central institutions and universities, and not to the state universities. Research also is critical for a knowledge society. Research across disciplines is needed for an enlightened uh, society. And we have uh, incredibly narrowed down our ways of doing research into silos, which really need to um, change dramatically. In other words, we address uh, research questions and not problems. Uh, and we ad address rather narrow research questions. Another aspect is related to societal uh, challenges. While research for its own sake and the generation of knowledge is fundamentally important, in addition, research and knowledge generation are very important for all these societal problems. All too often, our institutions, our research efforts, even if they are modest, are not linked directly to these challenges. And therefore, they fester, and we look for solutions for, from outside. And for sustainable de development, we are over-dependent on imports. India manufactures very little at the high deep tech end. It's beginning to happen now, but that needs to scale up phenomenally. We can't just have uh, leveraging our market power between different manufacturers. We need to have, be able to manufacture something uh, of significance ourselves. And that's happening, but again, that needs to expand into our ecosystem. <coughs> now, whatever knowledge is generated, which we have from multiple sources in our country and elsewhere, over historical time, there has been an expropriation of knowledge. Knowledge is not accessible to those beyond who were not involved in its direct generation or those who are not involved in power. So the very creation of libraries, archives, filing cabinets, bureaucracy, and so on, in a manner which has different layers of access and control and security means that the equal access to knowledge is considered 
troublesome. And in some areas, of course, this is true. Um, if you are, you know, in conflict with some other country, for example, uh, you don't have, you know, equal access to each other's knowledge. But in other areas, such as in education, research, health, agriculture, and so on, this wider access would be enormously valuable and actually generates much better long, uh, knowledge. But historically, uh, knowledge has been expropriated by a few, uh, even in learned institutions. Uh, and increasingly, universities have started uh, preventing access to their libraries, which are symbols of this access. So many years ago, uh, in addition to public libraries, university libraries could be accessed by anyone. You just come in, you sign your name, and you, and you go in. But increasingly, for a variety of uh, real and imagined security reasons, that's difficult. So knowledge is not easily accessible, even in the, it wasn't in the print time, but even in the digital time, for the reasons I started off with, it's not easily accessible. Now, the locking of access to knowledge has enormous consequences in systems such as the judicial system, the educational system, the health system, and so on and so forth. In other words, you end up creating intermediaries who can take knowledge and explain it to people who need the use of knowledge. So if you need to go to court, you need intermediaries of various kinds, you can't navigate the system yourself, even if you have all the uh, intellectual tools by your training. And imagine how difficult it is for those who haven't, and imagine how difficult it is for those who haven't access through barriers of knowledge, for example, uh, uh, of language. So the locking of access to knowledge is enormous and formally done in our system. And it's formally done not just because you can't access certain kinds of material, but even if you could access material, for example, through the courts and so on and so forth, you cannot be your own lawyer because you don't have the capability. And you don't have the capability because the training program and so on has such exclusiveness to it at multiple layers. So it's not possible for you to defend yourself, uh, even though in theory you can. Now, in the cyber physical age, this classical problem with knowledge has changed dramatically. You have a situation where all the knowledge which one has is, as I said in the Qualcomm example, the driving force of change. So all the physical objects which you see are increasingly being linked, and they are even in this room, to the internet and the wide world. And the control of all of the actions of these devices, and indeed the control of many of you, is by these cyber agencies whether what I'm saying is original or not, useful or not, silly or not, plagiarized or not, is something which you're instantly Googling and figuring out. Uh, and this has become a habit uh, amongst all of us. And therefore, the link between the cyber and physical is, is only growing. It's not that it's good or bad, but it's something which is happening. But what is difficult is not so much the all-pervasive uh, presence of digital aspects in our life, sometimes which we control and others, other times they control us. But what is interesting is the creation of a digital elite. As I said earlier, knowledge is power. And those who have knowledge and power are the elite. And the elite have wealth. And therefore, they control what happens to a large population. But this has changed dramatically in the cyber physical age. The digital elite today exemplified by the owners of the big digital machines, they have wealth disproportionate to what was there amongst the wealthy a long time back. Now, this is a fact of, of the matter. And there are many arguments about you know, whether this is happening legitimately, is it uh, against societal uh, cohesion or not, and so on and so forth. And one can debate that. But the converse is also true that those who don't have access to digital expertise and knowledge and understanding are perhaps destined not to be wealthy at all, even at, as outliers in that curve. And this is a big, big challenge which needs to be addressed. The consequence of this distribution of wealth and the consequence of this absence of digital access and knowledge and understanding is that the elite, we, tell the masses what they need to know. So we have the 
masses who are instructed what is good for you, what is bad for you, eat this, don't eat this, take this vaccination, don't take that, GMO is good, GMO is bad, this political party is good, that is not. All of these are done by analysis by the elite and fed to people in a manner of the choosing of the elite. So this is the knowledge economy where knowledge is driving decision making amongst those who don't have access to the tools of knowledge generation or the training to understand how to distill information into knowledge and decision making. And this is a big, big problem. What can India do in that situation? Uh, and what is the nature of this edifice? Will it change? The positive side is that there is a crack in the edifice. And that crack in the edifice perhaps is caused in no small measure by India's demography. And again, I will go back to the example of Qualcomm and its design engineers. You have a bottom-up swell of young people who want jobs, who want jobs in the knowledge economy. And whether or not their institution is good or bad or ugly, these people train themselves or get trained and find jobs in the best places in the world. And these are a very minuscule, small fraction of the youth of our country. And there's a minuscule, small fraction of our large demography. Imagine if this training and knowledge were available to a large population. Then this edifice can crumble. And in a knowledge-driven world, India can not only save its youth, have them an employable future, but can be partners in global change in a large way. So that is, needs to be a key um, role which we in institutions need to play to enhance the reach of our training into the rural areas, into other urban areas, and have knowledge as its foundation accessible to everyone. So this is not easy. <coughs> we are, as I said, if this dam cracks, uh, we have a big challenge and it's cracking. The water will fall, flow in two directions. In one direction, we will continue the way we are. We will still be a country where some of us in institutions such as these have access to knowledge, access to its understanding and use, and we will do well. This will be, at most, about 10, 15, 20 percent of our population, uh, of our employable population. The bulk of our population will not have access to these tools and therefore will end up being uh, extreme outliers at the other end of the knowledge economy. So not only will there be a divide between rich and poor in countries of the West, that sharp divide will increase over here in India also. So this is where we are. And so the question is, where do we go and how do we go? How do we go ahead? Now, one aspect which I started off was about how we need to have access to literature and so on and so forth. But the other really is what we need to change within our institutions. Our institutions have grown extraordinarily well. This one is 100 years old. There are others which are 75, 50 years old. And there are many, many new ones coming up. And these are, as I said, addressing only about 5% of our student population. 95% of our population doesn't have access to institutions of such quality. And even amongst this list of central institutions, even the lowest, one of the lowest quality is much better than many of the other ones in our state system. There are some state universities which are extraordinary, but they are the exception. So one major responsibility is to make our institutional archives and our libraries and our resources available through this, to this large community. We must have strong ventures which digitize everything we have in our library, digitize our classics, our literature, our you know, science from all over the world, uh, material which is off copyright, have massive programs in their translation, and so that these are accessible, convert these scanned copies of classical manuscripts, old manuscripts uh, into OCR, so that they are readable, and have them you know, translated on a very large scale. This is not a small enterprise. And this is something countries in the West have done for a long time. If you were in Sweden or Germany, you will have access to texts of all kinds in Swedish and German. We don't have that in Malayalam or Telugu or Bengali. 
we need to have that available. So institutional coordination on this scale, whether you're a science institution or a humanities institution, that's very, very important. Uh, this needs to be done even at the school level and at the college level. This needs to be done for textbooks. One extraordinary example which has come up recently is a biology textbook by Ron Vale and collaborators. Ron Vale um, came to India about a decade ago, uh, or slightly more, on a sabbatical. And he started the um, young investigator meetings. But he also got the idea here for starting what's called the iBiology series, which is a video program of teaching in biology in which the texts are also available. And those texts are translatable. There are such video programs for any course of any kind all over the world. Getting them into text and translating the text would be an extraordinarily valuable task. But Ron has more recently thrown a challenge to the textbook publishing world. He and his colleagues have created a fantastic biology textbook. It's called Explore Biology, X Biology. And that is an open textbook. It's constantly updated. It's free of cost. It's accessible to everyone. It's got QR codes so you can link to movies and so on. And you know, it's, it's there. Now, these resources are not sufficient. I went some months ago to one of the top colleges in Delhi University, where every kid had a smartphone. And every kid could access these resources or any other resource. And this was a meeting about, in I think, the zoology department. Very bright kids, very bright teachers, not one of them ever used any online resource whatsoever. In other words, in an era where we have moved from being the planet of the apes to the planet of the apps, where apps you know, link us to everything in the world, our brightest and best students do not use optimally many of our resources which are available. These are in the core metro cities. If you go to rural areas, the situation changes dramatically. There are extraordinary resources available, again, done by a professor in IIT Bombay and several others. Uh, Kannan and the MHRD ministry have worked to have develop um, the NPTEL and programs for teaching there. Those programs and self-certification are accessed by many, many students who have you know, a fire to get a career path ahead. So our challenge is to have these kinds of resources not only available, but used, and not only used for very utilitarian and important purposes, like getting a, a job or a degree or, um, or going ahead to the next level, but also in core areas of our knowledge economy, uh, of our knowledge such as arts, music, literature, and so on and so forth. So that requires an interface, just as the justice system required an interface taking you th through the justice system. We need an interface, a band of people who can ensure that those who have access actually use it. And that requires uh, an interactive environment. That's not easy, and that, but that can be done. <laughs> so as I said, the national level, there are some initiatives. These need to be populated. I showed you the National Digital Archives. That's growing very well, but it won't grow unless we populate it. It can't grow by you know, push alone. We have to pull and put and, and you know, make sure that it works well. There's also a major mission in language translation, which the Prime Minister's Science, Technology, and Innovation Advisory Council has recommended. Um, that uh, proposal will have all these kinds of translation, I said, at a modest level, more to um, be exemplary and stimulate the private sector from going in in a big way. Wherever core archives can be digitized and application programming interfaces made, that will stimulate the private uh, sector to go into that in a big way. The data protection laws will hopefully be in place <coughs> in a robust manner so that health, agriculture, energy, social data can be used in a manner where public access, as well as industry access, protecting privacy uh, and uh, you know, security is done. These are possible now. So those are the kinds of measures at the national level which are being taken. Uh, and should be enhanced. Institutions are already mentioned. Institutions need to reach out beyond their core duties alone. Uh, if you have the National Institute for X or Y or Z, they should make sure that you know, all 
resources, all knowledge in those areas are available. They go to the National Digital Library, but also disseminated widely. So this requires an understanding that such dissemination is part of, part of our core effort and not something peripheral. And therefore, internal resources need to be allotted to that, and external resources need to be added on and come to this. Uh, we all too often think that this component is something which you know, needs to happen on its own, but that doesn't. Academia, all of us. Uh, the Bangalore region is incredible in that there's been an extraordinary rise in people communicating science in their uh, languages. But that needs to be scaled up again uh, on a multiple level. There was a time when um, if you went into a doctor's reception room uh, anywhere, you would see only a handful of newspapers, maybe one or two, one or two magazines. And a third magazine would perhaps be a science magazine, such as Science Reporter or you know, something to do with careers and so on. Now you go, you see, just like you see 20 news channels, you see 20 magazines. All of them are clones of each other. All of them regress to the mean. And therefore, the option of you know, getting knowledge out of a chance encounter is lower and lower. Uh, and therefore, we need to have more innovative ways of doing that. Uh, and the digital solution is not the only one that needs to be a print solution, given the diversity in our environment. So academics uh, need to see this as part of our responsibility. And for that to happen, the metrics of academic progression need to change dramatically from the individual dev driven one into also one which includes community service. Now, all this sounds very well. We will have open access to literature. We will no longer have metrics about where you publish, but we will read what you publish. Um, we will not keep importance to awards, but you know how much you've contributed to society. This sounds like a proletarian revolution, and most revolutions eat their children. Uh, and therefore, we need to keep in mind when we talk about overthrowing the current edifice, uh, that we need to have a new kind of understanding, a collegial order, and that takes time to build. And this is something which, again, requires responsibility across from individual academics to institutions and policymakers and government officials and so on and so forth. So this is something which is a big challenge if you have to have a new order and not a new disorder. How can we have this change? Our current system is extremely linear and, uh, I would say, pyramidal. Uh, it's like a pile of samosas on the head of someone uh, carrying stuff. There's a top samosa and there are bottom samosas. And you can see the uh, bottom samosas here and the top samosas there. The bottom samosas provide the data. They're poor. There are many of them. The top samosas are few. They're rich and they have power. So this is a kind of structure. If you luck out and there are enough change taking place, you can go from bottom samosa to top samosa, but the chances are low. So this situation needs to change. And there is no linear path to this. And we constantly talk about us teaching them. We will translate this and give it to them. And they will learn, and they will become better off. These are all thought processes, again, which we must change. We're very used to those. And we must have a more interactive situation where our institutions are open to everyone, to all our citizens. And you know, we are much more interactive. That's a challenge. We have been isolated in our institutions for substantially long time, and that has allowed the building up of deep expertise. And isolation is important for building expertise. But openness is important for connecting that, uh, that expertise to change. So unless we combine the connectedness with the expertise, we will have a sharply polarized or an increasingly polarized country where those with deep connect will bemoan the lack of expertise available to make the change they want to. And those with expertise will say, this is how you make the change, but they will not get their feet wet. So these, the middle ground needs to be explored. That, therefore, I would use the jalebi as a metaphor. We should be interacting a lot more with each other at every level. Power, wealth, knowledge, and data with people at the center needs to be the way we look at the new world. This, again, requires a sea change at every level, from the way we run our laboratories, our institutions, 
our you know, clusters of institutions of city to be more ready to give than to take. And that's something which will come about only if we internally change the way we function in our committees, in our decision making and so on. So that's a change of heart. That change of heart can be <coughs> done by a place such as this, which has all the tradition, the power uh, to do this. And therefore, uh, the Indian Institute of Science, places like the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, major universities like Delhi University, JNU, BHU, Aligarh, these, are, these, are need, these need to be the centers of change. Now, so the central government, state governments, we don't involve the state government sufficiently in this and we bemoan the situation of uh, knowledge generation, education over there, but we don't participate enough. Our own institutions, academic and researchers, and very importantly, people should be at the heart of what we do. I'd like to end by giving a very local example. This is uh, from uh, Vachana from Basavana. And you can read it here. And basically, he's arguing, this is a metaphor for our situation today, that the rich will make temples for Shiva. And what should I, a poor man, do? My legs are pillars, the body the shrine, the head a cupola of gold. So listen, O Lord, things standing shall fall, but the moving shall ever stay. And that's an important lesson, whether it is for open access or our institutions or the way we do our science, we must have a certain kind of connectedness at every level from the individual to institutions. This translation is a beautiful translation and it was done by A.K. Ramanujan. And A.K. Ramanujan exemplifies this kind of connect. He was from a Tamil family in Mysore. He could translate and write from Kannada, Tamil, and Hindi and uh, English. He was a poet, and he explored the entire space uh, of culture in a manner which very few people managed. Uh, and this kind of ability to do this came from a situation where his father, who was a mathematician, uh, a, a maths teacher, and interestingly also an astrologer, allowed an environment where the kitchen, the living room, and the city were all mixing. That is an extraordinarily privilege, uh, great privilege for a relatively poor person to have. There is no reason whatsoever why such a privilege cannot be had by everyone in the country. And that should be our goal, and that should be our primary goal. Everything else we talk about, about how you know, we will be a large economy, or how we will be a powerful uh, IT power, or something or the other, are consequences of this kind of an ability to be original and connect. There is no way we can be original if we try to imitate the best original minds in the world. We should emulate the best original minds in the world, and this is the kind of emulation which happened. Ramanujan went to Chicago and was one of the leading lights over there as a professor. And again, you know, he influenced the whole world by his learning. So that's uh, eminently feasible. There is no way the institutes of science, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, or other great universities can be as good by the current metrics of Cambridge, Stanford, or Caltech, and so on and so forth. But we can be far, far better than them if we set specific kinds of goals which are both global and dependent on our context and have originality. For that, open access is essential. Open access not just to the scientific literature, but open access to textbooks, to learning, to the freedom of being able to learn in any language, and the, f uh, the freedom of access to our libraries and the growth of our libraries all over the country. So we need to mix this pepper we have of high quality, this few uh, cloves of pepper, with the salt of the country, grind the pepper so that it mix mixes more closely. And that's very, very feasible. There's, there's a significant population of our elite in numbers and quality much higher than any post-colonial country. And therefore, executing this responsibility is not particularly difficult. Thank you. Thank you. Sure.
we, we can switch it off here. Uh, I have my mic on, so you need just yours. Yeah, thank you, Vijay, for this wonderful exposition of many, many ideas woven into this whole uh, issue of open access, not only scientific knowledge, but also uh, the whole gamut of things, which is so essential for the overall growth of the society. Uh, I think, uh, let me first not say anything more, but throw open the discussion to the floor and see if uh, any of you would have any comment or query and then we will take it. Vijay, is that fine? Sure. We take that uh, forward. So if you don't mind, can you identify yourself when you ask a question? Uh, so and then uh, be very crisp in putting the question. All right. Um, Good evening, sir. Thank you for your lovely talk. My name is Shraddha Mohanty. Uh, I'm an integrated PhD student here in the Department of Molecular Reproduction Development and Genetic, Genetics. So um, I have a very fundamental question. Um, you said that uh, access to knowledge is imperative, and you explained very nicely why it is so. Uh, but don't you think it is equally important for the, the people who the, so Access to knowledge is important because you're targeting it at a certain audience, and only if the audience is receptive enough does it make a difference. Now, apart from higher, higher institutions, I think it is more important to look at primary schools because it all trickles down to the grass grassroot uh, level. So if you prepare students from a very early age, do you see them becoming competent enough when they reach higher education, um, you, you know, um, a higher level of education? So. Uh, when I talk with my peers, I find that whenever they did their schooling at an earlier age, we all find that, that many, many teachers lack uh, passion. And therefore, that, that clearly reflects uh, how, how students perform. So do you have any comments about that, you know, a lack of passion in, 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 in teachers? Well, um, a quick um, answer to that. Uh, I want agree or disagree about the lack of passion because I think that uh, is a consequence of multi, multiple uh, context of a society. Right? But it is true that students and teachers are both limited in a variety of ways to explore their full potential. Uh, the question is how does one do that? Many people give digital solutions to that of various kinds of methods coming in. But as I said, just access to those is not enough. You need to learn together in a manner where those digital solutions, if they are useful, are used. Other people, for example, the Azim Premji Foundation, put primary importance to training the teachers better. Uh, and they argue that the human element is critical and the digital one is an incidental component. Uh, I think both are needed. Uh, they happen in multiple places. but I i like to end this point by saying that we can't constantly debate that the ocean has to be boiled before we start on the next step. That's very difficult. So we must explore solutions where we slice through different components and make change happen despite all the imbalances which we have. And sometimes that can happen uh, reasonably well. There are some examples and we can talk about that later. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for your nice presentation. So I am Rishi from uh, Molecular Biophysics Unit, uh, PhD student. So uh, you are saying about the creating uh, knowledge and uh, which will make the power. But you are making suppose you are making ten powerful person with a good knowledge, but you don't have a space to keep all of them in your place so and suppose you will keep one or two and eight are going outside so is there any way to keep all your currency with you or something like that yeah so the question is that if knowledge is power but 
specific um, aspects of work in the knowledge economy, if it involves only a few people, wouldn't those who are left out of that choice uh, still remain as outsiders? So the point which, well, the, the analogy would be that in today's workforce, right, you may well have people at different levels in a factory, for example, but all of them would be employed. My point is that in the factory of the future, you will be unemployed unless you have a strong core foundation in uh, knowledge and in training and the analysis of data and its use in addition to your mechanical, electrical, or whatever skills. Whether, I don't mean power as someone who rises up in the factory hierarchy, but this knowledge as a mass base prevents those who are in charge from telling you what is good for you and what is not, dictating what you shall buy and what you shall not. You have that understanding. Uh, is there some polarization? All the questions are coming on this side. No, no, no. I'm seeing here, but very few. There is some chirality here. Okay, yeah. I'll come back. Yes, please. Talk was very interesting, sir. Uh, my question is about uh, a specific area largely related to the scientific journals moving to the open access domain. In fact, you started with... Uh, the business aspect of it right in the beginning, uh, uh, mentioning that that should crumble, the current model should crumble. Uh, just to say a little bit about the business aspect, if you look at it, the whole scientific journal publishing uh, <coughs> uh, is hardly about 10 billion business in the world. Uh, compare that to the total research spending in the world which is about perhaps uh, 1.6 trillion in that range. So what the world spends on the scientific journals is perhaps less than half percent, around half percent. But it's very important that that half percent unlocking the knowledge should necessarily crumble. And uh, the open access movement in the scientific world, which is in its uh, second, third decade almost, the movement has picked up very well. In fact, uh, the good Can news you come is... come to your specific yeah, query? Yeah, I'm coming to that. Because yeah. there are many hands okay. which I have Now, to the address. issue is, you know, India has... Uh, the good news is India has done well in terms of uh, the numbers on publish publications moving from ninth position to some uh, fifth position now. But in the open access domain, we are even better. We are number two in the world in terms of... Uh, the highest per percentage of uh, published articles getting into open access, 80% almost. Now, <coughs> my question is, recently you made an announcement about uh, India joining planets. But there is a situation is, while we move to open access, uh, you know, comparatively aggressively, the scenario is pretty, what I would say, uh, chaotic of scientific journal publishing activity in India, primarily because of open access uh, movement in a way, because today we have uh, more than 5,000 journals and uh, 4,000 of them are open access. It's a precarious situation. Quality has suffered. Now, will the plan S movement, how will it help in really taking India out of this precarious situation of open access journal movement becoming almost an open abuse movement. Well, thank you for that talk. Um, the um, point is that India is discussing with open, with Plan S about how one can have better access to literature. Secondly, but we are not, you know, committed to whatever plan S does or doesn't do. What we want to do, I outlined right at the beginning. The second point is that you seamlessly interchange open access with open access, quote unquote, open access journals of certain kinds. That is unfortunately a widespread use of the term, 
which is not correct. By open access, I mean open access. I don't mean open access journals which are proliferating over there. How that should be handled uh, is a separate matter, again, which I mentioned earlier, that you know, author publishing charges and access charges should be paid by the government. And that will that'll require that we define the kinds of journals where that can be paid by the government. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yes, can you? Uh, one minute, I'll come. Oh, you have the mic? Yes. So you have a priority. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> fine. It's a nice talk. Uh, my yeah, please. Uh, my name is Satish. I'm a PhD student from IMR DJ department. Speak into the mic. Okay. So uh, 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 I agree with uh, open access. The point what I wanted to say is, so uh, in case uh, as you projected uh, by 2035, uh, there will be 49 percent of uh, uh, people uh, uh, be in a rural side only. But uh, if you compare the uh, uh, the uh, repo uh, depositors of the uh, library, it's most of it is in. Uh, uh, English. So, if you uh, allow the open access, uh, how it will help for the uh, uh, people who study in their mother languages like uh, Malayalam, Telugu, uh, Tamil, where it be, and also uh, how it will, uh, how you will be, how open access will be helpful to improve the uh, 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 skills of the people who refer uh, online, because you can only increase the uh, knowledge, but skills should be. Uh, improved uh, by the presence of uh, uh, experiments or uh, models in front of them. Yeah. Well, um, that's, these are two very, very important points. The first point, you have hit the most critical uh, issue at hand. Um, access to literature is, of course, important. But access includes the ability to access. And therefore, language is a critical uh, aspect of that. So unless that is addressed, uh, having the doors open to your library is of no use. Uh, and therefore, translation must be a very major component. Our suggestion, which the Ministry of IT is taking up, is to stimulate the start of a movement where every article, it'll take time, is available to you bilingually in English and in your native language. Uh, and at least work with publishers to at least have the title and abstract of every research article initially available in any language of your choice. So those kinds of things are very feasible now with a uh, digital drive which allows that. Um, you know, and at least in science, with good glossaries in every subject, it's possible to reach something between 50 to 80 percent efficiency in translation. And then human intervention can ensure that that is valid. Uh, so this is feasible in science. It's much more complicated in literature. If you want to translate Kalidasa into German, you know, you can't do it by a computer. Uh, but you need to have much more human interface there. So therefore, a body of translators on a large scale is very important. All those of you who study in research, in education, and so on, should be encouraged and incentivized to also become, if you wish, translators uh, in a variety of ways. And that should be a very profitable act activity, either by itself or in addition to what else you're doing. Unless we do that, we're not going to head anywhere. And that can be done only by a, a large scale involvement. The number of Wikipedia pages in Indian languages is pathetic compared to those in many um, European, Asian, uh, uh, South American languages. And that's us. There's nothing to stop us from changing that. And as Vijay mentioned in the uh, in some time during the talk, actually uh, PM Stike has one of the uh, programs on this specifically, and that is already on, and efforts are already on to make. It. Maybe uh, you can say. Like well, uh, so that's the translation of the but I forgot to uh, address your second point, skilling. which is about skilling. Well, you know, that again is very critical, and there are like one of the slide I sh uh, slides I showed you on the Global Competitiveness Index talked about skilling being very important and retraining of the workforce. That's important. There, you know, we're making enormous effort in formal ways. But that needs to be connected to jobs in a manner where it's a constant on-the-job skilling. So that, I think, will happen relatively well for those who are employed. The challenge is for those who are not employed to get the skills to get into the workforce. So those are important, but those are much more addressable challenges, and they are being addressed. The more foundational ones are 
are great challenges where language and you know location geographical location shouldn't be barriers to opportunity okay uh, at the back yes Hello. Uh, uh, my question is majorly the accessibility of the open access material, because the majority of the institute has access. That's why you could access the majority of the open access. Because once you put it in the article or anything, you can access the open article. Because a lot of journals, like uh, most of the scientific journals, a lot of people use as SciHub, which is illegally downloads a lot of articles. Why we cannot have a legally driven uh, search engine where we could download the open access material? That uh, your friend uh, who talked about subscription, he sort of answered that. Because there is a firewall, you cannot, there's a, there's a paywall there, so you can't access journals which are paywalled legally. And therefore, that situation has to change. And they are an intermediary who shouldn't be there. They have no role in the matter, big publishers. They claim that they enhance the quality of the material so that you can read it Whereas if you were to just publish it as a PDF and without all the supplementary material organized properly and the HTML links and so on and so forth, you as a researcher will find that difficult. To make life easy for you, they put in a lot of effort and make things look really fancy and charge you a large amount. Then your committees also accept these charges, all our committees, because they say that if you publish in such and such a fancy journal, your paper is better than if you publish in a less fancy journal. And so we are also complicit in that. OK, yeah. This side. No, you've been raising your hand for a long time. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. I liked your talk. Uh, I am from Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research, and I am working in library. So my there are two questions I have, and more related to library and uh, journal subscription. Uh, um, in the um, beginning of your talk, you said that uh, India spends a substantial amount in journal subscription uh, as, a con uh, as a country uh, ho as a whole. Uh, so is there any initiative from the current government or uh, towards a national consortium? Uh, because I was I am currently also a part of a consortium which negotiates with journal uh, publishers. And uh, there are there were several efforts made uh, to come up with several departments coming together and form a larger consortium, and which failed over a period of time, and n nothing much progress happened towards that. That is one. So I would like to know if any such mandate is going to come towards the uh, for the departments, uh, government departments, to come together in future to have a better spend, uh, better saving towards general subscription, that is one. Another is the uh, policy which was made for on open access from India, that is DST, DBT open access policy. Uh, that uh, is more or, like, more or less like a, a guidelines than a mandate, strict mandate for the research institution uh, to strictly follow that so that uh, the institutional repositories uh, get populated, uh, which is not really happening currently. Uh, and also, uh, a good thing uh, to see is uh, the biological data sharing policy, which is coming up uh, by DBT. Uh, and uh, is it likely to become a mandate or just a guideline? Thank you. Right. So I'll, I'll just answer, um, well, the three questions really, but let me try to answer one or two. Uh, the first point I already addressed, there is a move by the government through the Principal Scientific Advisor's Office to get all the national agencies which pay for subscriptions and our institutions to negotiate with publishers along the lines I said, i.e., there will be a capped subscription charge which includes free access for all subscription journals to everyone in the country. That's our goal. How, how much we can manage that is a challenge. Secondly, there will be cap charges for author publishing uh, uh, charges uh, in a list of open access journals, which are certified as being you know, reasonable or good, and so on and so forth. So that takes care of that. Um, and that will be done soon. The reason why your earlier attempts fail is that we seem to be very worried about how the publishers will do uh, if we make these demands. They're doing fine. Uh, they're, they're Profits are substantial, and if they don't get their profits this way, they'll find other ways. 
what is the right thing for us to do is the second part. That is the open access policy which we should have here in our institutions should clearly not ask for ridiculous things. They not only ask you for the impact factor of the journals you publish in, they ask you for the average impact factor, then they ask you the average impact factor of the department, of the institution and of the country. I mean this is just completely ridiculous. It conflates precision and accuracy and that scientists can actually do this boggles the mind. So that needs to go. Right? And finally a third point was about data sharing which, which the DBT biological um, data sharing is one aspect but that should be a general one for all data sharing and that will happen soon. Okay. Uh, yes at the end you have the mic. Yeah. Most of my questions have been asked and I got the answer. But uh, the skill development part is missing. Like the when we go to the openness more, it should be more of machine readable also. Right now we are stuck at only PDF modes. So we need to look beyond PDFs. And the national framework has spoken a lot. Uh, was any uh, discussion happened on the national framework on openness by the uh, at your office with the agencies or the institutions or the councils which are into the research and development what were their uh, any uh, uh, what they said for that I just wanted to know if, if it has happened otherwise and then the skill improvement in the library science or the publications we need a uh, maybe a, a bachelor in publications or a masters in publications where they will use all these technological skills to make more open. Uh, what we have now share is like if you say there's a policy of my institute. Can you okay, I'll put can my. Can you be a little bit brief? Uh, yeah. Let's uh, let's uh, okay. stop there and Vijay let it address because there are many yes, hands. Yes, yes, okay. still to Thank, you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, the OCR part I already mentioned. So there will be. XML. <laughs> I beg your pardon. XML. So so whether how one can take text and move them to a form which is readable and usable by links elsewhere is a big challenge. It's expensive, but it's doable, and that's something which you should embark on. Okay. Okay. Uh, there was, yes. Apurva? Uh, Apurva. Uh, I'm Apurva Patel from IISC. I want to go back to a point which you mentioned earlier, that is the disconnect between research and teaching, which has happened, unfortunately, in our country. And one of the ingredient is that lots of specialized laboratories have been set up in our country in the last many years after independence. And the, they may have their own purpose, but the fact right now is that they have become insulated and lost contact with passing on their knowledge to the next generation. The other problem which has happened over there and that is that once a job of that particular project gets over, the people need reskilling and there is not much environment or mechanism to be able to do that. And this is for example the status in CSIR labs. So I would like to know if there are any directions or future thinking of how to remedy this kind of situation. But, you know, the remedies for both are top down and bottom up. It's much better, much, much better to have a bottom up remedy than a top down remedy. There is nothing at all to stop our institutions, particularly in cities like Hyderabad, Pune, Bangalore, Chennai, Delhi, to effectively, in reality, merge these research institutions with their educational institutions by being one seamless web of connectedness. Uh, the IISC could make all the faculty members of JNC, NCBS, NSTEM, Raman Institute, and so on as adjunct faculty and have them teach your undergraduate courses. You haven't done that, you're unlikely to do it on your own. And the reason is simple, because you feel a sense of possessiveness. And I don't mean you as an institution here, but this is true of all institutions. IIT Madras will not use CLRI next door and its faculty as teachers routinely. 
let alone CLRI. They will not use Anna University next door because that's a state university. So unless we break these mental barriers bottom up and invite teachers from Ramaya College or Anna University to come and teach here in a manner which is consistent with our programs, we will only bemoan the existence of this divide. These institutions then will become deemed universities and have their own teaching programs for their own 10 or 20 or 50 students each year. That attitude needs to change. Your students need to be able to go over there and be able to teach and credit courses. Nothing to stop that happening bottom up, but that's not happening. So we are trying to push the formation of clusters of institutions. We've had meetings in Bangalore, Hyderabad, Pune, and Delhi to encourage this to happen top down. But a bottom up effort in addition would be very, very valuable. And that same thing goes for the CSR labs. They need to be proactive and the DRDO labs and the ICMR labs to be more engaging. Uh, similar labs all over the world, elsewhere in the world, have 20 to 50% of their budget interacting with the ecosystem. The CSR, the National Aeronautical Lab, should have 30% of its activity in IISC. That used to be the case uh, when Rodham was the director, when the people used to walk in and go back and forth. That doesn't happen. So we are to blame for creating these, amplifying these divides whose potential was created structurally. But we also have the potential for reducing these divides. Uh, not necessarily only through a top-down structural change. Uh, Avi, what's your upper limit on the time? Because we will go on for next few hours. <laughs> Ten more minutes. Okay. So that limits to about four questions. Uh, okay. Uh, let me come to this side. Yes. Can you? Because you you have been raising the hand for a while. Thank you, sir, for the talk. I am Ankan uh, from here, uh, PhD student. So I have two incidents to share, then your comments followed by. So I was talking to a professor who is my uncle in state university. He was very much complaining about the fund allocation, which we have, polarization. He was telling you are studying in ISC, you have a lot of fund. But I am a dean in chemistry department here, you, I don't have fund. So what to do in that respect? And second question, like when I talk to peers here, my peers, they don't want to go back to their respective university, like bachelor's and master's you have done in Kolkata or Pune, and have come back to ISC. We don't want to go back. If you ask me, I want to do It might be a political scenario, an economical scenario. Or how do you solve that, these two problems? I think yeah. you, you have hit the most critical aspect, because one can bemoan the situation, and the question is, what is the solution? First of all, about the state universities not being funded well, well, ISC is rich. People in ISC don't think they're rich, by the way. Uh, but they're certainly richer than a state university. But that's it. So that needs to be addressed. And the other aspect, our institutions need to be attractive for you to be able to go back there. It's all very well to say, go forth and teach there, be in rural areas and, or in smaller universities. That's not happening. I think, let me summarize two, two aspects of our approach which we're taking now. Uh, well, one, and one example. Um, what we're trying to do is to put in place a new national research foundation. And that's articulated in the national education policy whose draft has been circulated. Uh, that policy, by the way, deals with right from school education to higher education and research, in which there's a chapter on a national research foundation, and that addresses your question. In summary, that hopes to be a new foundation which will have additional funds to all the other agencies which are there Though they carry on their business. And these additional funds will address both the funding of the state university system and the development of quality over there. That's a chicken and egg problem. In the current system, competitive system, you can't fund that because they are not of quality. And because they are not of quality, they will never get funded and never get better and so on and so forth. Right? So that cycle has to be broken by institutions such as this, at the initial stages at least, partnering with those institutions locally or on thematically to submit joint grants so that that quality can go up. This was what, uh, this is what has been done. This and what I told you about the clusters earlier has been done in many places around the world in amongst, for the clusters, which again try to do what you suggested in Marseille, in Nice, in Barcelona, in Madrid, clusters of institutions where people go and teach and do research of the kind which Apurva said should be there between institutions and between research labs and institutions has transformed these so-called backwaters into front runners. You know, today's 
big successes in science can come from anywhere. They still come from the big ships because they attract people later on. But innovation, ideas, originality is coming from multiple places. So the clusters are one aspect. And the second is the mentoring aspect of the National Research Foundation. If these two things are done, then I think we're home. It's good to start sooner rather than later. OK, yeah, you wanted to. Uh, what is the? Uh, No, no, others cannot hear you. From the Department of Physics, I have a quick comment and a quick question. The comment is that about this clustering you mentioned, uh, maybe it's not adequate, but we have an example at IASC. We have a program called JAP, you must be aware of, which is running for Astro. 37 years, the joint astronomy program between RRI, IIA, IASC, and ISRO. Um, faculties from those institutes come and take part in teaching. Their students come and credit our courses and all the institutes benefit. Um, the <coughs> question I have is about um, the, the mediators that you mentioned um, who will be um, and um, are expected to play the very important role of actually doing this thing. Um, so my question is, do you see it happening um, with the already privileged people that are there or do you uh, think that we also need to create that um, human resource in some way through some special program, particularly given the very fast evolution of the medium and the scenario? Yeah, um, I mean, both these are very important points. First of all, about the joint program in astronomy and astrophysics. That's a fantastic program. I'm aware of that. Congratulations. But keep in mind that that has resulted in a relatively modest linear growth of a small slope of the astronomy and astrophysics community in the country over these last 37 years. There are people of extraordinary quality, but there are not large number of people of extraordinary quality. Right? That was an additional aspect of outreach and training at multiple levels the program could, be take, could uh, take up. Quick uh, point, uh, Ajay. If you look at the 30-meter telescope, other astronomy ventures all over the world which India participates. If you look at the laser interferometric gravitational observatory, um, the CERN effort, which is not an astronomy, um, the ITER effort, the total budget per year of all of these put together in two or three years from now will be equivalent to the Department of Science and Technology's annual budget. The total number of people, the denominator, who are involved in all these mega science efforts globally are going to be <coughs> a few hundred. This is not a tenable situation. The data from these experiments and other experiments all over the world is available free for everyone to use. I talked about knowledge and data being, should be available to everyone. One major venture the physics community could make, and similarly the biology community, or the history community, or the energy community, is make global data available in all languages through application programming interfaces which others can make. If we don't do that, we will point out our efforts over decades and be, while we'll be legitimately proud of our successes there, we will continue along that linear path, right? And that's the example I gave from Basavarna. That is, as long as we want to be stable, we will fall. Right? We must look and flow and grow. If we don't do that, we are in trouble. So that it requires an intermediary category of people who will do this transition back and forth. They must also be there, but they must be respected. And they must be valued. And that requires a cultural change, which I think will happen. It's not that it's impossible. I mean, you had a question. Uh, can you? Yeah, uh, you alluded to some ongoing negotiations with publishers for uh, uh, enabling open access for everyone in the country. Uh, is it uh, so? Is uh, our uh, is India's position uh, similar to what Plan S people are trying to do, or others are contemplating, or this is something that uh, is sort of homegrown and it has its own sort of uh, views and goals and and uh, and momentum. So. Um, our discussions with publishers have so far been informal, but we've had formal discussions both with Plan S and with the community in India. 
the fundamentals are what I outlined earlier right at the beginning. Those are also the shared fundamentals of Plan S. Plan S has delved into detail with specific publishers and what to do and what is the mode of transition, how do you go from this situation to that situation, what time, what are the funds and so on and so forth. We haven't gone into that deep dive, but we hope to do that soon. Um, so uh, my next question was going to be about when we can expect this process to be concluded, but uh, yes. Yeah, Plan S itself was hoping to have it concluded in January 2020. That's unrealistic. Right. And they have moved it by another year. Okay. And I think we have a few months. So we had a discussion and we told all the um, um, science funding agencies okay. to continue with business as usual f till April 2020. Okay. And between April 2020 and April 2021, we will work hard to try to move to the new model. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Professor Bhatt. I am Sri Bhatt from physics department here. My question is slightly away from this main stream. While talking about great Ramanujan, you mentioned he had this kitchen, living room, and the city all combined in one. Some of the import I missed. Would you briefly amplify? Yes. So basically, Ramanujan's family, and this he articulates in his writings about how he was connected. At home in the kitchen, they spoke Tamil. In the living room, interacting with the city in Mysore, they spoke Kannada. And going outside for their work, for his work, sorry, outside in, in, in the world, they spoke Kannada. And when they were talking about the world and so on in the living room, they spoke English. So he was comfortable culturally with all three, as opposed to having one language and learning the other two. He was had a deep understanding of all three. That is rare, but it's not such a big deal if you think of it. But it's sad that it's rare. OK. Uh, OK. Can you give to, yeah. And then up, OK. Uh, OK. One of the two. OK. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I think I must be one of the most uh, unwelcome uh, guests over here because I represent a publisher. I uh, work for Royal Society of Chemistry, a society publisher, you obviously you know. So I just, uh, I mean, I've been following your tweet on uh, India's willingness to open, I mean, join planners and things like that. But at the same time, I think a, a few, uh, I think one year back or something, there was an MHRD notice to uh, NITs, if I'm right, which said any, any uh, you know, publications which are paid, any paid publications will not be considered for your no, uh, your academic uh, progression and things like that, careers and things like that. I, I understand that is for you know, predatory publishing and things like that. But I think there is also a need for a clear differentiation between genuine open access publications and the predatory publications. So, so what are your thoughts on that? So, you know, uh, first of all, you're most more than welcome here. Uh, <laughs> and the Royal Society for Chemistry is more than welcome. And, you know, your outreach, your involvement with chemistry <coughs> professionals is terrific. The argument which such societies make is that that component, this outreach and interaction is important, and the journals serve that purpose. But at the back end, most of them, either directly or indirectly, are linked with the publishing machine of the kind I talked about. And that is an important challenge. So if the MHRD gives a notice about some kind of publishers or not, those are matters of detail where we can look at it. But I think. Learned societies, our Indian academies of science, need to move to a model where resources come to bring up the quality which is needed. I'm not disputing the quality. Maria Lepton, who heads the European Molecular Biology Organization, which runs the EMBO journal, pointed out that you can buy a meal or a dress which is inexpensive or fancy, and depending on or expensive, and that, and depending on what you pay, you get a variety of uh, choices. So you cannot say that I want the high-end choice, and I don't want to pay for it. So the question is, why should, in this particular context, if I am the cook, I've generated, I've grown all the ingredients for the meal, I've, you know, developed that. And if you now make a very fancy dish and place it for me, how am I paying for it? I'm both, dev I'm part of the development process. It's my data, it's publicly funded data, right? So we need to move for a different kind of business model where quality is ensured, but those who are generating the data for that quality 
are not being made to pay for it. That's feasible, but that's that will require you, the publishers, also to have another business model. Yeah, the last question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Nisha. I am a postdoc at IBAB. Uh, I understand most of the questions and queries were related to science uh, journals and articles as such, but you also spoke about dissemination of knowledge at a different level for people who wish to learn and require the uh, and the information that they require is not available to them. But there are such initiatives elsewhere, for example, the open courseware at MIT, etc. I'm not aware of if uh, higher educations here, premier educations here, offer uh, the courses and knowledge uh, dissemination that happens on uh, on the campus online for anybody to access and learn. Is that an initiative that uh, can be propelled from? Uh, yeah, I can't top speak. Down? Yeah, I can't speak for the Indian Institute of Science, but I know that IIT Bombay does that hugely. Uh, IIT Delhi probably does that. Uh, the NPTEL I talked about has that phenomenally well. And um, you know, many of these smaller engineering college students use that widely to jump across this teacher problem. You know, uh, about the quality of teachers or teachers not being aware of things. Teachers and students learn together. So that's you know shot up in India a lot for areas of engineering. It would be nice if that moves into other areas also: language teaching, uh, humanities, music, arts, the basic sciences, and so on. That hasn't happened that much, to my knowledge. Okay, I think uh, with one this last question there. Uh, where? Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, discussion, and I'm Nivedita from Open Source Pharma Foundation. So as you can see, the name represents open source, and we work in the pharma. And we work in the field of neglected disease. Uh, now, answering to Nisa's question, um, and also Professor Bijay Raghavan, uh, we have created a uh, couple of platform which is quite open in the field of pharma. Uh, so recently, we have come up with uh, a platform called TB Patient Data Common, and also a AI-based knowledge base and knowledge graph for tuberculosis. So these are the area that I want to say you guys should explore and kind of utilize it for the high-end research activity. And I, I, I'll be more than happy to share the link with all of you. And these are all free of cost. And we have created this platform in collaboration with one of our partner in uh, US. So the TB patient data uh, common has been developed along with Axiomedics and i 2 to Transmart Foundation. And the knowledge graph has been developed with the help of Ingentium. So definitely there are organizations within India, those who are working towards creating the platform that is open access. Thank you. I think you no, that's have, just a comment. Yeah, you, yeah. you want to appreciate? <laughs> well, so I don't so need an appreciation. <laughs> I don't need an appreciation. But <laughs> what <laughs> I'm trying to convey I'm here is. Because yeah. I want yeah. to call an end to yeah. this. Thank you. Very that's nice. Fine. Thank you very much. I think you will all agree that this has been a very fascinating afternoon. Uh, with very important uh, points and issues raised by Vijay and a very active participation uh, from the, all of you. And uh, uh, with this, probably let me call an end to this very interesting session. We can carry over this discussion to T. And uh, before that, uh, I'll give the platform to Shagun to uh, close this session. Thank, Thank you, you very much. We do have some formalities, so uh, <laughs> we will conclude it uh, officially. Uh, thank you so much for all of you. Uh, now I request Professor Abhinandanan and uh, our librarian Dr. Anand Bhairappa to uh, come on front and uh, hand over the moment to the speaker and the chair of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is a free subscription to all the journals. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Anand. Thanks, Avi. Uh, with okay. that, we are almost at the end. I just take this quick 30 seconds or one minute to thank all of uh, you for joining us. 
and the, the ones who made this possible by reaching out to larger people, our partners in this organization, uh, in addition to DST Center for Policy Research, Center for Society and Policy in IAC, and uh, library was an uh, event partner for this event. And we also used our help from um, friends, Divicha Center for Policy Research, and Aditya and group is here. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, India Bioscience from NCBS campus, uh, uh, Lakshmi and the group actually helped us to reach out to you so that you could get to know about this event and, and everything. And thank you all for joining. And, and tea is waiting for us outside. And, and hope to see you in another such event. And happy Diwali and happy weekend.